Good morning, everyone. I have to confess, this is uh, very strange for me because it's been over three months now since I have stood in this church in front of an audience. Um, so it's very nerve-wracking, I have to confess, uh, because it, it was so easy when you were standing here in front of an empty church. If you made a mistake, you could just redo it. But here, if I make any mistakes now, it's live, so to speak. Um, so do uh, bear with me, and uh, I'm sure you'll be gracious and generous in your understanding. Mentioning live, uh, some of you will be aware that we now have a Sego live stream on YouTube. Can I get a wee woo? <laughs> you would be terrible game show uh, audience. Can we get a woo? woo. Um, we had a few technical hitches, but we're hoping that uh, last week, but we're hoping this week everything goes out as planned. Um, it can, I'm right in saying this, I hope the, the gentleman at the back can correct me. It can be viewed later. Yes, so you can go back and watch it later, um, but it is live, which means right now there will be people who can join in with us even though they're not here. Um, so it, in some way it expands our sense of community that uh, there will be members of the parish who for one reason or another can't be here this morning and they can join with us. But I want to make a plea, don't, uh, don't log into the YouTube and watch us live from your bed because you can't be bothered coming to church on a Sunday morning. Uh, it's a great feature. We hope it blesses people, but we still want to stay in the habit of gathering uh, where we can and as safe as we can in these times. Um, so you are very welcome. You're very welcome if you're watching us online, whether that's live or later on today or in the week. I want to address something really important. Um, who wants to get a haircut? Yeah, I'm, I'm desperate. Somebody, somebody mentioned to me now about the hair, and it, I'm just looking at it here. It's a disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. I feel like I'm turning into Samson minus the strength. Um, maybe I'll just need to eat one more Weetabix every morning just to get the strength up. But I'm looking forward to a haircut. But there were two things during the lockdown that I was really keen and anxious to see return. One was hairdressers. The other one was church. So one out of two so far is great. And it is uh, wonderful to be back here together. And we pray that the service this morning uh, will bless all of us as we come to worship the Lord. A couple of announcements that I want to highlight before we start our service. Our Easter vestry is coming up both here in Sego and in Ardmore Parish. In Sego, the date is Monday the 19th of April at 7.30. And in Ardmore, it's Wednesday the 21st of April at 7.30. Uh, so do, uh, we want to encourage people to come along to that. Uh, even if you're not a registered vestry person, uh, we had that period of time where people could register. It's still uh, an opportunity to come along and hear a little bit about what's been going on in the church last year. We get a financial report from Philip, our treasurer, which Philip has put a lot of work in and, and is very detailed. Uh, I don't want to build Philip up too much there, but there's always a lot of uh, very important information in those uh, reports. And it's an opportunity then for those who are registered vestry persons to vote for this year's uh, select vestry. So do spread the word about that and do uh, attend if you are able to. Uh, another announcement, uh, we just want to remind folk about our uh, intention to have a confirmation uh, later on in the summer. We've had a number of people who have come back and said they would be interested, but if you know of somebody, uh, perhaps a child or a grandchild, who would uh, be interested in, in coming along and being confirmed, uh, have a chat with myself or Terence over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I would also say that confirmation isn't just uh, for young people. I am an example of that. I got what I refer to as a shotgun confirmation. Um, growing up a Presbyterian, we had no such thing as confirmation. Uh, and so when I decided I wanted to go and train to be a Church of Ireland minister, uh, that was one of the things that I had to do. And I ended up uh, getting a confirmation about a week or two before I was supposed to go for the interviews for selection conference, so hence the shotgun confirmation. So I got that as a 29-year-old. Um, so confirmation is open to all uh, who, who want to come and explore their faith and to confirm those baptismal vows. So if you're not confirmed and you're an adult and you're thinking, I might be interested, do have a chat with me. I would, I would love to, to talk through that with you. Uh, another announcement, uh, many of you will remember back in 2016, a handsome young chap from Lurgan joined this church. No, it wasn't me. Uh, it was uh, our good friend, Jeff Hamilton, uh, who did his deacon year here between 2016 
and 2017. And many of you know that Jeff uh, was appointed uh, earlier in the year to the parish of Anna Long, and his institution is later on this month on the 22nd of April. So really just to highlight like that for people, obviously because of uh, coronavirus restrictions, there will be a, a restricted gathering, but just to keep Jeff uh, in your prayers as he begins this new stage of his ministry, him and Jill are moving down to Anna Long. I'm sure he'd be devastated uh, to, to, to leave Lurgan, um, but they're moving down to Anna Long to begin a, a new uh, ministry there. And so do pray for Jeff and Jill uh, as they make that step. Finally, uh, many of you will be aware that on Friday, the Duke of Edinburgh passed away. I've been struck over the last few days of just how important an impact that the Duke of Edinburgh had. Here in this church, we uh, have been particularly blessed, uh, especially by the efforts of people like Edwin and Keith with the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme. I never did the uh, Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme. I probably wasn't uh, uh, sort of sensible enough as a teenager, uh, but I know many of you here have had the opportunity as you grew, grew up, and uh, even in my few years, I've had the opportunity to see a number of our young people come through the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme. And so a really incredible impact by a man who lived a long and full life. Later on in our service, Kyle is gonna lead us in some prayers as we give thanks and remember the Duke's life and pray for the royal family. But I think just before we start our service, just it would be appropriate just to have a few moments uh, in contemplative silence to give thanks for the life of the Duke and how he impacted so many and even indirectly impacted many uh, young people in this parish as well. So let's just uh, bow our heads and in a few moments of silence, just give thanks for his long and full life. a short prayer. God of our lives, we give thanks for the life of Prince Philip, for his love of our country, and for his devotion to duty. We entrust him now to your love and mercy through our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. We now turn to our service and the congregation's responses are in bold some words of greeting. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, to sing your praise with gratitude, and to listen to your word with eagerness, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're now going to stand and sing. Uh, our, our restrictions uh, encourage us to sing with our mass on and to sing gently. Uh, so if, if you're able to do that, please join in with us as we stand to sing this wonderful hymn, hymn number 32, How Great Thou Art.
Please be seated. I've often shared how I believe that this next part of our service is often a, a, a real incredible gift given to us by our liturgy, the opportunity um, to pause, uh, perhaps after a busy week where we haven't had much time to, to stop and reflect, and to think about uh, those things that uh, maybe have taken our focus away from God, are those things where we have maybe, by our actions and our words, have brought hurt and injury to others. And so we, we come and we reflect upon that, and we say sorry to God, but I always feel that uh, confession isn't just about us saying sorry to God and receiving His forgiveness, that's the important part, but there's also then that challenge as we receive God's forgiveness to think to ourselves, how do we be better, how do we do better? if we have injured or hurt somebody, how do we go and make that right with them? And it's challenging, but I think it's an important challenge for us to reflect upon as we gather here in church each Sunday. So I want to just give us a, a few moments just to reflect on those things that we want to bring before God as we come to confess. Let us pray. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Let us therefore confess our sins, and we say it together, God of mercy. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done, and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us all for all that is past and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. And so may God who loved the world so much that he sent his son to be our saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the collect for this, the second Sunday 
of Easter. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in the pureness of living and truth through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now I'm going to invite uh, Joe Smyton up, who's going to bring our first reading to us. The reading can be found on page 709 of the Pew Bibles. The reading is from Isaiah, chapter 26, beginning at verse 2. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, the nation that keeps faith. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast, because you trust, he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal. He humbles those who dwell on high. He lays the lofty city low. He levels it to the ground and casts it down to the dust. Feet trample it down, the feet of the oppressed, the footsteps of the poor. The path of the righteous is level. O upright one, you make the way of the righteous smooth. Yes, Lord, walking in the ways of your laws, we wait for you, your name, and renown all the desires of our hearts. May a soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. When your judgment comes upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. But your dead will live, their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Joe, for bringing that reading to us. We're now going to stand and sing the hymn number 219, The Servant King. i 
Please be seated. I'm going to invite Trevor up now, who is going to bring us our second reading. Thank you, Trevor. <clears throat> the reading is from John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Trevor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to open up your word this morning, we pray that you would speak to us from its pages, plant those words like seeds in our hearts, water them by your spirit, and help us to grow into the people that you call us to be. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder, have you ever heard of the term FOMO? Hands up, anyone ever heard of the term FOMO? No? Okay. One or two people? Okay. I was going to say that FOMO is possibly uh, more of a young person's thing, so well done to those who had their hands up. Uh, you're counted as a young person. Uh, uh, but FOMO is a, 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 an acronym for uh, fear of missing out, F-O-M-O, -O, FOMO. And it's a social anxiety that stems from the belief that others are having fun whilst the person who has the FOMO uh, is not present, hence the fear of missing out, whether it's a party, uh, something on social media, a concert, or some other communal, communal event. Do you remember those, those, those times when we could gather together? 
And it's probably more, as I said, a young person's affliction, yet deep down, um, I would probably argue that we all have some uh, measure of, of this particular anxiety, because none of us want to miss out, do we? And whilst this terminology, FOMO, is used in a casual sense, and it's probably used somewhat tongue-in-cheek, um, it is a real anxiety that comes from uh, the sense sometimes that people have of disconnect, and that's probably something that resonates quite strongly with us in this last year, a sense of disconnect. And in today's gospel reading, we see the, in my view, the ultimate example of FOMO. Poor Thomas misses out on what, a, what is possibly the most amazing and important event, not just in the lives of these disciples, but quite possibly in the history of humankind. Poor Thomas isn't there when the resurrected Christ appears to his disciples and his friends. But we're going to touch on that in a few moments. I want to set some context for us to begin with. At this point, the disciples have placed themselves, I suppose you could call it a kind of lockdown. That's another word that's entered our vocabulary in the last year, lockdown. Uh, many of us hope we reach a point when we never have to hear that again. But they're in a sort of lockdown, a self-imposed lockdown. Why is that? Well, our reading tells us that these disciples have a fear of the Jews, who at that very moment, the Jewish authorities would have been hunting down the disciples of Jesus. Now that they have uh, gotten rid of the pest that was Jesus in their eyes. They want to completely eradicate not only the man, but his movement. And so they're, they're on the lookout for the disciples of Jesus. So here are these disciples gathered in this house in Jerusalem. There's probably a lot of fear. Uh, there may even be a bit of bickering. You should have done this. No, you should have done that. What are we going to do? And here they are, and they begin to hear these stories, these rumors that people have seen Jesus. Some have seen an empty tomb for themselves, yet there's still this air of uh, disbelief, doubt, pe perhaps even pessimism. We can only imagine the conversation that's going on in the room in that moment. They may have been debating all that they've heard. Surely some of these disciples might have been skeptical, if not all of them. Those who claimed to see Jesus were clearly deluded. They were crazy. Jesus couldn't be alive. We saw him killed on a cross and buried in a tomb. With our own eyes, we saw these things. Worse, some of these people who claimed to see Jesus might actually be lying to us. I'm sure the thought in the room was, surely it can't be true. Yet, in amongst all of that, there may well have been those in the room who felt some faint stirrings of hope. They might have been remembering some of the things that Jesus had said to him before he, he was executed. Didn't Jesus say after all that he would rise from the dead? Didn't he say that? There was, of course, the evidence of an empty tomb. Could it be that Jesus was actually back? Some in the room, I'm sure, had a lot of confusion. Perhaps what they heard actually terrified them. Jesus back from the dead, really? That is scary stuff. And then into this mix of conversation, debate, argument, emotion, suddenly Jesus appears and says, peace be with you. And I want to pause for a moment just on those four words, peace be with you. On the surface, they appear a very simple, common Jewish greeting at the time. Uh, pardon my Hebrew pronunciation if there's any Hebrew scholars in the building this morning, but the, the, in Hebrew, the greeting was Shalom Aleichem. And it's a greeting that's still used today. Yet for those in that room on that particular day, in that particular moment, who would have heard that, Jesus' greeting offered so much more than a common hello or what about you. Here was Jesus, who only days before had hung on a cross, 
suffering and finally dying, standing in the midst of the disciples in a locked room, offering peace, offering greetings. And it wasn't just any peace that Jesus was offering in this moment, but this greeting in this context would have shown that all that Jesus had promised, all the things that he had said and taught these disciples over the last few years, all of that, all, all that he had said about God's peace, God's love, and God's grace were in his risen form in that moment totally realized. All the promises that Jesus had made were now fully realized in this resurrected Christ. This peace that Jesus offers his disciples in this moment is the peace that he won on the cross. And it's the peace that Jesus offers to these scared, battered and bruised and confused disciples. It's the same peace he offers us today. This group of people who only days before had abandoned Jesus, who had turned their back on him almost to a man, now gather around him and are offered his peace. No matter what you've done in life, you may be sitting here thinking this morning, okay, I've been all right, or you might be sitting here thinking this morning, I've done some pretty terrible things in my life. Here were a group of people who betrayed Jesus, and Jesus invites them to, to experience his peace. So wherever we are in our lives, Jesus' peace is as relevant to us as it was to that group of disciples gathered in that locked room. Now, unlike the account of Jesus' appearance in Luke's gospel, we don't read any, anything about skepticism. Simply that these disciples, in receiving Jesus' peace and experiencing the, the reality of the resurrected Christ, are, are simply overjoyed. It is poor doubting Thomas who misses out, who gets to play the skeptic later. However, for now, in this moment, we read that the disciples present are overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I, I would imagine that's probably an understatement. But they were overjoyed and accept for themselves the reality of his reappearance as they see Jesus' hands and his side. And it's into this attitude of rejoicing and newfound peace that Jesus offers a new command as he commissions his disciples with these words. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus breathes on them, and our reading tells us that the disciples receive his Holy Spirit. And in a way, I think this is the Christian life in a nutshell. We, like the disciples, live in a state of fear, despair, distress, guilt, before we encounter Jesus. And when we do encounter Jesus, when we accept the reality of the risen Christ for our own lives, when we accept Jesus into our heart, he brings peace and rejoicing into our lives. As we see, we no longer need to live in fear, but we can find freedom in the victory that Jesus has won on the cross. And yet that's only half the story, because we, again, like Jesus' disciples, receive a commission from him. Jesus sends us, just like he sent those first disciples to be his witnesses, to testify to the resurrection truth, to draw others into that same sense of peace and rejoicing that we ourselves experience as part of God's family. Being a Christian is not just about receiving contentment, although we do uh, receive that contentment and that blessed assurance that we are God's and he is ours. Being a Christian is not just about receiving that contentment, but our Christian journey, our discipleship, our faith comes with a commission and must bring with it a commitment. Our Christian faith is not simply a, a comfort blanket to make us feel better, although it does do that on many times, but it is an invitation to a community, a way of life, if you like, that sends us out to draw others into this family. Back to our FOMO, fear of missing out, poor Thomas. I want you to imagine the scene. The disciples who are gathered in the room have this amazing encounter with the risen Jesus. 
where there was despair, uncertainty, and doubt, there's now rejoicing, peace, and a newfound confidence. Here is a room of people who have encountered the risen Lord and have been commissioned by him to carry on his mission. And into this room walks Thomas Didymus. His name means, Didymus means twin in Greek. Interestingly, I didn't know this, but I found out this week that the name Thomas also means twin. It's Aramaic. For, it comes from the Aramaic word for twin. So make of that what you will. But anyway, here is twin twin coming into the room, being told by the disciples of all that they have experienced. If you had been Thomas, what might your reaction have been? Well, if it were me, I might have thought that these disciples were experiencing some sort of mass hallucination. Perhaps they were so caught up in their grief and despair that they had imagined Jesus had returned. Maybe they'd all eaten a bad piece of cheese the night before. I don't know. But certainly, if I were Thomas in that room, in this moment, being confronted with, quite frankly, the outrageous tale of Jesus' return, I think I might have responded in very much a similar way as he did. And this is what he said, and you can imagine him saying it, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands in his side, I will not believe. Perfectly sensible and reasonable statement. And so Thomas the twin becomes Thomas the doubter. And I think it's such an unfortunate nickname to give this man. For he plays an important role in the resurrection narrative of Jesus, which we're going to see in a few moments. A week passes by. Imagine that. Imagine being the group of disciples who had seen Jesus, and a whole week passes by, and there's nothing, and you're, you're wondering, maybe by the end of that week, you're thinking, did we imagine that? It felt so real. No, it definitely was him. It was, it really was Jesus. But then imagine being Thomas, watching your friends descend into some kind of mass hysteria, some kind of insanity, starting to wonder to yourself, were they right? Did they actually see Jesus? And then thinking, no, there's, there's no way. Common sense has to prevail here. I have to be the one who's grounded in reality if they can't be. And so a whole week passes, and then Jesus appears once again into a locked room, no less. And he offers his disciples again, his friends, and this skeptic, this Doubting Thomas, he offers to them all his peace. And then he turns to Thomas and addressing that each point that Thomas had made only a week before, Jesus says, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. I want to show a pic on the screen here, uh, if we can bring it up. It's by uh, uh, an artist called Caravaggio, and it's the incredulity of St. Thomas. It's a very well-known painting. And I love this painting because there's a lot going on, but I think the thing that I love the most is Thomas standing there, and it's so real and visceral. His finger is in the wound, and you can almost see in his face, this is how I read it. Oh dear, I look really stupid now, don't I? That's how I read Thomas's face in that moment. It's a, a wonderful painting that's so... Uh, it speaks lots to me, but here is this moment where Thomas, after only a week before, demanding, I will not believe until I get to do these things, until I see for myself the wounds of his crucifixion. And here he is, standing with his finger in Jesus' side, real, touchable moment for Thomas, where the reality of the risen Christ is made very much real for him. Thank you, gentlemen. What a moment. What a wow moment in Scripture. Jesus demonstrates not only supernatural power in returning from the dead and appearing in a locked room, but he also demonstrates a knowledge beyond human understanding in the way that he very specifically addresses every concern that Thomas had made only a week before. Jesus wasn't even in the room, and yet he knew what it was that Thomas 
needed to see and experience. I honestly don't think uh, any of us, certainly not myself, if I had been in Thomas' situation, would have behaved very differently from him. I think Thomas acts perfectly reasonable in asking for proof. And it's probably something that in our own lives, perhaps even in our own Christian journey, it's something that we have done ourselves, where we have, a, we have asked for proof at one point or of another. Perhaps in a moment of deep despair, we have looked at the sky and said, God, are you real? Help me. I think many of us have been in similar positions where we have desired to have incontrovertible proof of the spiritual things of this world. I think that's a natural human trait, to seek knowledge and understanding. And, and we only need to see that, uh, to see the, the field of science, uh, to see that human beings have this drive to seek out knowledge, to find out more things, to understand the world better today than we did yesterday, with the hope that tomorrow we might find out even more. It's a perfectly natural, I believe, God-given desire within each human being to seek knowledge, to understand more. And yet the resurrection goes beyond mere human understanding. There are some things in this world that no matter how much knowledge we seek, we might never understand. Again, science is proof of that. There are many things about our universe, as smart as we are as, as human beings, there are still many things that we do not understand about our place in the universe. I think that's an exciting thing, but there are those things in our lives that seek as much as we may, we may never find out the answers we're seeking for. I think we call those things miracles. And the resurrection is a miracle. And God is in the business of the miraculous. And Jesus, in this moment, offers his friend, his disciple Thomas, real proof of the miracle of the resurrection. It's a wonderful gift that he gives to Thomas in this moment. Jesus here is showing that he isn't a ghost or an apparition like some heretical sects like the Docetus believed. Jesus is showing here in this moment that he is real flesh and blood. And on the cross, he was real and his sufferings were real and his resurrection is real too. Thomas's skepticism is important because I believe it offers us today a way into this story. We live in a world of uncertainty and doubt. And sometimes part of our faith journey is to learn how to wrestle with those doubts and to sometimes accept by faith, to accept that there are just some of those things that we will not understand this side of eternity. That at some point, in the age to come, all will be made known and revealed to us. But for now, we have to sit with those doubts and to wrestle with those doubts, but to accept by faith. Faith and fact are two different things, but that doesn't mean one is better than the other. There are two ways of looking at the world around us. And for many of us here this morning, we will have found that our faith has greatly enriched our lives. As much as any facts might do, our faith has enriched us in times when mere knowledge or understanding can do nothing for us. And so this is why Jesus says in verse 29, to those of us who must wrestle with our doubts and accept by faith, he says these words. Jesus in this scripture reading this morning, in a sense, almost turns to us and speaks these words. He says that we are blessed because we have not seen and yet have believed. That's Jesus talking to us. As he's talking to his friends in that room, he's almost speaking to the side and saying, Psst, you lot listening this morning on the 11th of April, 2021, you're blessed because you have not seen and yet you have believed. Thomas comes off with, I, I feel a, a, an unfair and an undeserved reputation because of this event. This man is forever known as Doubting Thomas, which, as we know, is a byword for anyone who displays doubts and demands direct experience of something before they believe it. 
I'm sure we've all uh, encountered a, a doubting Thomas before in our lives. Somebody who said, unless you show me how it works, I'm not going to believe you. But I think I'd prefer to call Thomas sensible Thomas, a well-grounded Thomas. I think Thomas raises some reasonable questions, and in a way probably represents all of us as we experience our own doubts in life and ask our own questions. And yet, for as much as Thomas is known as Doubting Thomas, he should be known for something much more important, something that is often missed, yet was part of our reading this morning. Thomas's doubts were not the end of the story for him. For in seeing for his own eyes the reality of the risen Christ, Thomas utters these famous words in verse 28. My Lord and my God. See, Thomas was no longer doubting Thomas. He had had the benefit of seeing for himself the reality of the risen Christ. But now, more importantly, Thomas was confessing Thomas. An experience in Jesus' presence for himself, he could do nothing other than confess him as Lord. And the challenge for us this morning is, is our response the same as Thomas's? History suggests that Thomas had a prolific career as an apostle. He is believed to have traveled far beyond the boundaries of the Roman Empire to preach the gospel. And some traditions say he traveled as, as far as modern day India by the start of the sixth decade of the first century. This disciple, like many of us here this morning, had his doubts, had his fears. Yet when he experienced the reality of the risen Christ for himself, he confessed him as Lord. And that drove this man to serve his Lord, even to the edges of the known world. When we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, it comes with that same call in our lives too. That we might serve and follow Jesus wherever he may call us. For some of us, that may well mean uh, being called to different places across the globe. And, and, and some people here in church this morning have been involved in mission trips to, to a variety of different countries across the world. Yet for many of us, I suspect that call might mean being called to our neighbor, our work colleague, family, or a friend. We might this morning see something of ourselves in Doubting Thomas, and that's fine. I think that's natural. We wrestle with doubt. We have our fears. But let us also see something of ourselves in Confessing Thomas. Let us become Confessing Thomases that we might confess Jesus as Lord with our words, but also with our actions, and that we might let Jesus work through us so that more people may encounter that reality of the risen Christ for themselves. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that, just like Thomas, you meet us in our doubts and our fears. You invite us to experience the reality of the risen Jesus for ourselves, that you're kind and gracious and gentle with us, and that you love us like you loved your disciples. And Lord, I pray this morning for each one of us, as we wrestle with our doubts, as we have our fears, as we see something of ourselves in Doubting Thomas, give us a boldness to also be like Thomas and how we confess you as Lord. Equip us, encourage us, and send us out, Lord, in this Easter season, Lord, that we might be witnesses to you, for you, and that we might bring others to come and witness the risen Christ for themselves, to experience your love and your grace for themselves. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen going to invite you to stand uh, as we sing a, a wonderful hymn, a hymn that is so appropriate to this time of year, hymn 247, When I Survey. It's a hymn that draws our attention to the cross, which is so appropriate for us at this time. So we stand to sing hymn 247, When I Survey.
Please be seated as Kyle comes to lead us in our prayers. Thank you, Kyle. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bring our prayers before you this morning in our wonderful spiritual home, Sego Parish Church. What a privilege it is to be back in the building for worship. We know that you, Lord, are in control and are watching over us to comfort us, guide us, embrace us, and to love us with the salvation that you give to the believer. For every believer, Lord, the promise of eternal life we must take up the cross and follow you. The Lord has risen indeed. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for the church family and our dedicated members of the parish who have worked tirelessly to bring our church services online and also to reopen the church. The work that has been done to organize this and keep the gospel matches being relayed has been wonderful, a true blessing to us. We pray this morning for anyone who is struggling or unsure about their faith, Lord. We pray you will speak to them and reveal your love and understanding that only you, Lord, can provide to give them peace in their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This morning, Lord, we mourn the passing his Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Eternal God, we give thanks for the life of Prince Philip, founder of the Duke of Edinburgh's award. We remember his vision and imagination, his interest in young people and his support for them. Inspire us with the same commitment to serve friends, neighbors, and strangers alike through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Give courage to the Queen and the royal family in their loss, Lord, and sorrow. Reassure them of your continuing love and lift them from the depths of grief into the peace and light of your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the royal family and especially the Queen, who has been a tower of strength to the nation with her strong Christian faith and understanding. She has been making difficult decisions for the better of her country. We pray for our own local government and politicians and the unrest on our streets at present. Please, Lord, bring peace back to our streets and communities which have been destroyed in these senseless riots. We pray, Lord, for all our security forces and the PSNI 
please, Lord, protect these men and women as they protect us in these uncertain times. We know you are in control, Lord, and will bring back normality to us and throughout the province. As we gather in church, Lord, to praise you, we pray for our church leaders. Pray for David, our bishop, Terence, our rector, Stuart, Jim, Heather and Trevor, and our faithful church wardens. Alison, our music director, who all, as a Christian team, bring us the word of God every week. To all our church volunteers and employed staff who look after the building and provide such good facilities, we pray, Lord, for the select vestry and all the tough decisions that have to be made, that you, Lord, will guide and support them. We also pray, Lord, for all our community. We pray, Lord, for people who are struggling financially in these very strange times. We ask you, Lord, to reach out to them. Also, we pray for all families, that you, Lord, will make sure that everyone has enough food and clothing and not to be too proud to ask for any help. We, as a church, Lord, can provide support and prayer for anyone who asks. Lord, we thank, thank you for Jim and his team in Kilgamein and beyond. The great work they are doing, we pray for the Kilgamein residents group who have provided free food and support throughout the pandemic. Um, in Kilgamein and the surrounding areas. This is work of you, Lord, and your compassion. Put in your hand in people's hearts to carry out this wonderful outreach, Lord. We thank you. We pray, Lord, for the sick, the lonely, the depressed, and the bereaved this morning, and all that do not know you, Lord, as yet. In their hearts, that they will come to love and trust you. Pray, Lord, for the coming months and years that everyone will be vaccinated and protected from this horrible virus. We give thanks for all the NHS and the doctors and nurses who have been on the front line. Plead, Lord, protect them and their families and bring renewed hope and health to all the world. Lord, keep all our schools and children safe and give our teachers wisdom. In our own parish, we pray for all our parishioners who have been re bereaved in recent times, Lord. We pray, Lord, you will be there for them, to comfort and strengthen and guide them into your light and presence as we, a church family, are praying for them. We pray for you, God, the King of Kings, that we realize that there is no gray area. It is clear in your word that only if you are a believer, you will enter the King of Heaven. In a final prayer and tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh, we give thanks for his life, Lord, and his good work to the nation. He could sail a yacht, he could fly a jet, drive a carriage, command a ship, paint a picture, shoot a stag and play a pool, Lord. Yet, he was also an innovator and champion of the young and old alike. Salute joyfully to Prince Philip. God save the Queen and the nation. Everyone has a sense of duty, a duty to society and to their family, in his own words. Amen. Let us join together, everyone, in the prayer that the Lord himself taught us, our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Kyle, for leading us in those prayers and for that tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh. We're now going to uh, sing our final hymn in a few moments. Um, before we do that, actually, I just want to thank all of those uh, who were involved in our service this morning, uh, Heather and the ladies, for leading us in our worship, uh, the readers and the prayers, and also just a special word of thanks to the gentleman at the back. Uh, I mentioned earlier about our live stream. Um, both uh, men, uh, Jim and David, have put an incredible amount of work into getting the technology right, uh, doing all the research, and we're so indebted to them both for that and throughout this uh, pandemic for all the work they have, that they have done. So uh, I think actually let's give them both a round of applause. They'll probably tell me off after for that because they're both uh, men who go about behind the scenes and just get stuff done and we're really indebted to all their efforts and to all those who serve uh, in the many different ways throughout the church uh, to help make Sunday morning our reality. So thank you all. So yes, we're now going to sing hymn number 669, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Please stand to sing.
Some words of blessing as our service this morning draws to a close. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, raise you up to walk with him in the newness of his risen life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.